There we go. Um, if you have questions and you don't want to blurt them out, you can definitely put them in the chat and we'll kind of look at them as we go and, and try to get those in to Denise as, as we're going today. Um, any questions on format? Okay, this is Dr. Denise Puga. She's from the HRPP IRB office. As you know, they a legacy, not a legacy system, but they've been using a system called IRIS uh, to submit your protocols to the IRB for review and, and, uh, and approval. Um, they are switching on Monday, uh, supposedly going live with a new system called Huron. Um, and Denise is going to give you guys some information on that as, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Denise, for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I don't want to carry the microphone, so can I, can I get verification from somebody on Zoom that you can hear me okay? I'm sure that everyone here can. Yeah. Can I just get a yes or something from someone out there in the perfect? Thank you. I appreciate you. Okay. One of the things I do want to bring up is that this is supposed is just a demonstration of what Huron does. It's not a formal presentation. So please ask questions. Just just yell them out. You can do them here. Obviously, if you're here, so it's very easy for you to ask the questions, those that are in person, but those that are also on Zoom. Feel free, just unmute yourself, ask your question, and put yourself back on mute so if your kid walks into the room, we don't have to hear that conversation. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Those are the only things I want to share with you before we get started. I'm going to share my screen, and this is a, a new computer that I haven't used before, so please bear me, with me as I try to figure out how to operate it. Um, let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit. Okay, so this is just a PDF, which I will be sharing with Corey, so Corey can send it out to you. And it has two very important links. The first is the Huron Knowledge Center, which mm -hmm. uh, I'm very proud to show to you because it has step-by-step -step instructions on how to submit your most basic um, submissions to, to the IRB. In the past, IRIS has not allowed this flexibility. We were not allowed to take screenshots of the interface. That's why we couldn't create these uh, tools for you. But Huron is very transparent and allows us to do this. So I'm going to select it, and I'm, we're going to go right to that Huron Knowledge Center. And what you'll see is that you have a basic introduction to Huron. And these are just uh, PowerPoint presentations that have been turned into a PDF. And you can go through it to find out how to navigate your dashboard, your IRB workspace, and your study workspace. We'll be going over that here, but also in case you fall asleep, you can always go and look at these PowerPoints at your time. Many of you have approved, uh, received IRB approval in IRIS, and those studies may be moving into Huron. It depends what kind of research you're conducting. If you're conducting exempt research, that research will continue its life in IRIS. And so if you ever need to submit a minor, minor modification to an exempt study, or if you need to update your study personnel, it will all be done in IRIS for exempt research. If you have a full board study or an ex expedited study, those will be migrating into Huron, and those are referred to as legacy studies. Within, yes? How long will those do? For as long as uh, it, it still has going. So exemptions are for three years, and the idea is that it's, your study will be allowed to live there for those three three years. Yes, Corey. An easy way for you to know the next study? An easy way is usually, and we keep uh, making reference to this is you want to look at your initial approval letter, which will tell you what it was determined to be. There's also another way, but I don't know if it's as consistent, is the letter at the end of the number. So if you've ever seen that M or that F or that D at the end, it, it means something to our office. If you have an M, that means that the study was exempt. The D means that it was expedited, and the F means that it's full board. I don't expect you all to remember this. I do, however, want you all to always reference your approval letter. Your approval letter lets you know what your study was approved as. And that's how you can tell which study is going to continue in IRIS and which will be move, moving to Huron. Within the first year of your legacy study being converted into Huron, uh, you do need to submit a modification. If you don't submit a modification within the first year of that study being converted, your study will be administratively closed. You need to submit a modification in order to finish populating your IRB application in Huron. So because the two systems talk a different language, not all the information can come over. And so you're going to have to log in and finish populating it. The application in Huron is very short. And so you shouldn't take you very long to go through that process and finish um, populating it. The other thing is that we did not bring over your study documents. And so you are going to have to attach your latest documents that you're using. This is really important, and I'm going to make this um, highlighted. 
you don't have to bring every document that you have ever gotten approval for. We know that sometimes you sit, submit modifications and you have like three, four versions of your consent documents. You don't need to bring all three, four versions. You bring the one that you're currently using in your research. The, the surveys you're currently using, the recruitment materials you're most commonly using right now. Those are the ones you need to attach to your Huron application. We also have instructions for how to submit your initial IRB application moving forward, how to get a delayed onset. I know that's something that a lot of investigators are curious about. You're gonna submit that 118 determination request in Huron, and there is a process for that, which you can find the instructions here. If you ever need a not human subject determination, there's also the process for that. As any of you that have ever worked with our office, you know there's quite a bit of back and forth to get your application prepared for the review process. And then once it's reviewed, there's a little more back and forth to get it to a provable state. There is a PowerPoint presentation to help you navigate that back and forth. And then finally, if you get your application approved in here and you're likely to need to submit a modification, a personnel change request, you might have to report something to our office. All those forms are available on, in Huron and there are instructions for how to do that. I'm gonna select just one of these um, PDFs so that we can kind of look at it together and what you should expect. There's a little bit of background and preparation for what information you need to begin the process. So there's just a little background to all of them. And then uh, once you get to actually submitting that modification, let's say for legacy study in this case, we do tell you where to click. So you click here, you click here in order to move forward through the submission so that you can get that modification in. And then we start showing you the pages that you'll be encountering and we provide you additional information to help you navigate those pages. What information do you need to provide us in those specific pages? Okay, and then we'll be going over the IRB application here in a minute. I just wanted to let you know what you, should, you can expect from um, the PDFs. Okay. Okay. Let me. And now my PDF. Where is it? Oops. It has gone away. It seems. Sorry, guys. It's not my usual setup, so I have to figure out where it left it. Maybe. Yes. Okay. The other link that I want to share with you is the protocol template link. So many of you have probably navigated to this page in order to get your consent documents, your assent documents. You've probably made use of these consent, I mean, these templates. And above those, you'll now see protocol templates. So the main difference between, between IRIS and Huron is that in IRIS, you had to fill out this very lengthy IRB application. What's happening in Huron is that you're actually going to fill out a very short IRB application and you're gonna be attaching a protocol template. The protocol template, uh, I believe, particularly health and kinesiology, have some experience with it. You might have had to use them before when you submit your protocols. And so the protocols basically take the, the role of the IRB application, and that's where you're gonna tell us what you're gonna do. That's where you're gonna tell us how you're gonna recruit your participants, how you're going to consent them, what procedures you're gonna expose them to, where the risk and benefits are. So you're gonna outline all that in your protocol template. The protocol template is a Word document which will make it a lot easier for you. Yesterday in one of the presentations, one of the uh, PIs actually brought up that this would make it a lot easier for faculty and their graduate students to work together because now you have a document where you write all your procedures and you can basically email it back and forth and put that protocol together and then just attach it to Huron. So that's one of those wonderful things that comes from using this, this Word document. I'm gonna open what the social behavioral protocol, which is probably the most common one that will be used by most people in attendance here. There is one for biomedical research if, if you ever do that type of research, and there's one for exempt if you know that you normally do research that is exempt or classified as exempt, you can use that protocol. If you don't know, and this is your first time submitting to the IRB, I highly recommend you just default to the social behavioral protocol. You're gonna, we're gonna open it and you'll see that it asks for very basic information as to who the, the PI is, who's the study team, and then as we go through it, you'll find sections such as what's the purpose of the study, which is something you're used to telling us in IRIS. What's the background, what's the literature review, all that, things that you're very used to giving us in IRIS already. What's the inclusion exclusion criteria for the population you're recruiting, 
What are the procedures you're going to expose your participants to? And then we have this red text that kind of guides the information we're looking for in those specific sections. Um, there's also just, just more sections that have to do with letting us know what recruitment process you're going to do, what the consent process is going to look like. So it's very much the same information that we were asking for you in the IRIS application, except one of the things we're hopeful for is that you'll see a lot less redundancy. So there's not going to be a lot of redundant questions asking you for the same information. Now you can have sections that will specifically ask you for those uh, procedures. Does anybody have any questions or any comments about the protocols? If you've used them before, do you want to give your feedback on those and share with the group? Okay, that's fine. So let's, let's say I made a resent application. Like I think I'm a champion, but mm -hmm. I'm not. Turns out I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not What's going to happen next? Do I, have, do I have to fill out the other protocol templates? Or? That's a processing question. It's a great question. And one of the ideas we've been throwing around is maybe because it is a Word document, we'll be able to add sections to it to let you. If something, some information is missing, we'll, we'll edit it for you so that you can just add that information. So rather than having you completely redo another protocol, that's what we'll be doing. That's what we're throwing around. Again, we're, it's a processing issue. Uh, but if it's the first time again, you've never submitted, you, don't, you didn't talk to your IRB coordinator, let me step back. When it comes to your IRB coordinator, they are your best resource. If you are not sure if your protocol requires IRB review, you don't know if it's exempt, if it's expedited, you don't know what to expect, always call your IRB coordinator, have a conversation with them. They'll be able to guide you through maybe what's the best protocol for you to use. If you don't want to call your IRB coordinator, just default to the social behavioral one. It's not going to hurt you any to just do that one if you don't want to do the exempt one. Okay, so that's that's what I guidance I provide on that. Any other questions? Oh, I see chat. Yeah, okay. Okay, is there a template for a continuing review was what Chris asked. And um, the only annoying part of this is that you can't quite. <laughs> Let's see. No. There is a different process. It's not a form. So Chris, I'll, I'll answer that question later in the presentation. I think it might be jumping a little bit ahead. So that's probably why I'm a little um, at loss. But I will address that as to how you submit your continuing review here in a minute, because um, that's a process a little further. And I first want to introduce everybody to Huron before we get to talking how do you submit your continuing review. It's not a template. It's actually uh, a continuing review will be submitted in Huron. It's not a, it's, you don't need to submit a template. It's a process in the system. And that's why let's, let's get to that in, towards the end of the conversation once we've um, talked about what the dashboard and what Huron looks like. Is there, in, is there any questions related to the protocols template at this point that I can address? Okay, Chris is saying okay, perfect. Okay, when you log into Huron, this is what you're gonna see. You're gonna see your dashboard. Your dashboard is gonna have some very simple things like shortcuts. So for example, if you select create, you'll be able to right here from your dashboard, create a new study. Or if you ever need to report anything to our office, you can just select report new information. Things that you would report to our office are instances of non-compliance. Uh, if you ever have an anticipated problem, if you ever have a participant complaint, as a result of the research, this is something you would report to us, and there's a form for that. All your studies they are approved. If they're uh, coming up for expiration, if they're soon to expire, they'll start populating here, so you'll know that you have to take an action to renew that study. Any study that you have been recently looking at will list here. And if it's a study that you'll know you'll be submitting a lot of, let's say, modifications on, or you just, it, maybe your dissertation proposals, or you know you'll constantly be revisiting, you want to select that little pin, and then it'll pin it to your dashboard so you'll always have easy access to that protocol. The other thing is your inbox. Your inbox is where you will be notified of any study that is requiring your attention. So for example, this study was created earlier. I, I have impersonated Corey, and I started a study. And I haven't completed it, so it's telling me in the state that it's in the pre-submission process. And so what it's asking me and it's prompting, prompting me to do is to go back into the IRB application and finish uh, my submission process. So 
you can always select that little uh, icon or the name of the study to navigate to the study. And so now you're in your study workspace and you can start making modifications to it. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the study uh, workspace in a little bit in a few minutes. But first, I just want to let you know what else you have available to you here in your dashboard. You can also look up studies with this filter in the route throughout Huron. So you can look up a study by the ID number, by the name. And further into Huron, you can actually have more things like who was the coordinator handling, what is the name of the PI. So there's more filters you can use to identify the studies that you're looking for. There's this little add button, which allows you to add even more filters and find the studies of interest to you. You can look up who the coordinator assigned to that submission is. So you might have an IRB coordinator you're used to working to with, um, because there's so many of you here, I can't specifically say department-wise. So maybe you have Esther, maybe you have Josh. Uh, I think those are the, the people you most commonly work with. But you know, Josh occasionally likes to go on vacation, like we all do, and somebody else might take over while he's gone, or sometimes the workload is very high, and so somebody has to help him. In those cases, you'll be able to see who that coordinator is working with your submission. You can contact them directly and have a conversation about your submission. So that's really great. That wasn't something that was really obvious in IRIS, but now you'll have that ability to know in, in here on. There are these little help buttons up here, and if you select them on the homepage, they actually have some videos. So Huron has created some videos that help you navigate Huron. Um, and you can always use these and they'll help you through the nav navigate Huron. The only thing I caution is that the temp the, these guidance tools that we have put together, and unfortunately I can't ever seem to get to what I want. So I'm gonna stop doing that. Um, the PowerPoint presentations in the Huron Knowledge Center were specifically made for our research population and the type of forms we expect you to submit um, here at AM. These are provided to anybody that uses Huron, any institution that uses them. So they're very general. So you can use these as a secondary tool, but you may always want to default to the ones that we are providing for you because those are specific to our population. Like, for example, the administrative check-in process, those, that's not something that may be done in another institution. So you won't be able to find a, a video to help you through that. So you want to go and reference the PowerPoint slides we have put together for you. And the last thing is uh, this little gear. You'll probably find it in other places, and it allows you to uh, filter what information you have access to in your inbox. So, for example, if you don't really care when your study was created or modified, you can select OK. And that makes this information that you have access to even more streamlined. So that's your uh, dashboard, and this is, are the kind of things you can have access to there. One of the things I want to point out is that Huron is a compliance suite, so it's not always going to be the IRB. Uh, currently, the conflict of interest office is already in Huron, and many of you may have already logged in to do a uh, disclosure on there. The IRB is the next office that's being added. After that will be animals, and then after that will be biohazards. And this is going to take some amount of time because of all the work that goes behind the scenes to activate it. But your inbox in the future may involve some requests or information from other clients' offices. I say all that to let you know that if you ever just are concerned with IRB matters, select that IRB tab, and then it'll take you to all things IRB. You have the submission tab. So if you select the submission tab, everything related to submissions will be available to you. There's a meeting tab. If your study goes to full board, I believe information will be populated here. If not, you shouldn't ever see anything here. This is really for internal purposes. It's for our office to be able to manage the, I, the full board studies. Reports, um, most of these reports will probably not be very useful to our investigators because you can only run these reports on the studies that you are listed as study personnel. And if you see what they are about, they're really intended for our office to run reports on big um, data. But they're available to our investigators. So if you ever want to run a report, you can go through these and see if you can find something interesting about your data. The library tab is very important. So this is where all our documents currently housed on the HRPP website are going to be centralized. And so you can see all our standard operating procedures if you're interested um, in how our office operates and what we make reference to whenever we are doing an audit or uh, you know anything, anything related to how our office functions, you can always come and look at our SOPs. They're not currently loaded, but they will be once Huron goes live. 
There's in the general, there's the investigator manual, which I recommend everybody download and have on their desktop. It really talks about what's expected of researchers when they're conducting research. And it's a great way for you to see what the expectations are for you as the investigator. And really just answers very basic questions that, that many investigators have as they approach the IRB process. We have worksheets and checklists. And all that's to say that these are tools that we utilize to make sure that our studies are being approved in a manner that is consistent with federal regulations. Uh, I always like to bring this up. If any of you are ever interested in knowing what criteria we use to approve your research, you can always download this worksheet and go through it and make sure your applications are meeting that criteria. So this is a metric we utilize. Um, checklist, if you're ever working with vulnerable populations like prisoners or children, you can always download this and see what tools we use to approve your research. And then all our templates will eventually be loaded here. So you'll be able to get your protocol templates here, your consent templates, site authorizations, any templates that our office provides, they'll be here for you to download and access. Any questions about any of that? Yes. No, that doesn't have, yes, sorry. Uh, does this, and I'm going to open it so everybody can see it, does this criteria have a checklist for the documents we expect to see uploaded? And, and it doesn't have that, um, what documents you need to upload. What we do have access to is in the PowerPoint presentation put together for submitting an initial, there's a link to all the potential study uh, documents that you may need to attach into an IRB application. So I think that might be more useful than this. This is basically talking about what the criteria we need for approval, which has to do with minimizing risk, um, making sure that the risk to subjects is reasonable in relation to the benefits they expect. So it's a, it's a different criteria. It's not necessarily what documents to attach. Okay. The other tab that I wanna bring your attention to is this Health Center tab. And this has an additional very nice Word document that Huron has provided for how to navigate Huron. Uh, it's the IRB research guide. I highly recommend you make use of it. If any of you are conducting multi-site research or collaborative research, there is a, power, uh, a Word document that actually helps you navigate that too as far as Huron's concerned. And I believe those are the only two that as an investigator you would be interested in. There's a video that very nicely explains how single IRB works and what the process for that is. If you ever have a federally funded project where multiple institutions are working together and there's a requirement for one IRB to be the IRB of record. Uh, this explains that process to you in a very nice accessible video. I'm gonna go back to the submissions tab and show you what is here in that submissions tab. There is the in review. So any protocol you're currently working on that you have yet to uh, receive approval for will be here. Any study that is active will be listed here and any new information, anything that you report to our office, you'll see here. If you are working on a collaborative research in the external IRB and rely on IRB sites tab is where you'll be able to um, identify those institutions that are collaborating on that project. These are blank because Corey um, has never been in that type of research. <laughs> so the all submissions, um, this is really a catch all. So whatever state the submission is in, it'll be here. It won't just be initial uh, studies. It can also be a modification, a continuing review. This is where all those submissions go to live. So you can always find a submission you're looking for here. And if you have ever closed a study or discarded a study, you can locate those studies here. That's where they go. Before I proceed, is there any questions? If not, I'm going to walk you through what the application in Huron will look like. No? Okay. I'm going to create a new study. And it'll bring us to the very first page of the IRB application. The first page of the IRB application asks you eight very simple questions. It asks you to tell us the title of the study, the short title, give us a brief description of the study, identify your study is multi-site or collaborative or a single site. Before you select multi-site, if you ever think you might have, I recommend you call your IRB coordinator and get guidance as to whether it is in fact a multi-site study or not, because it opens the pathway to a very different process. And sometimes your study may involve collaborators, but as far as we're concerned, it's still a single site study. So pick up that phone, have that conversation, and then your IRB coordinator will guide you through what to select. It'll ask if another IRB will be the IRB of record. 
and then it'll, if you're the person putting the application together, it'll default you as the principal investigator. To change the principal investigator, you just select the ellipses and it'll bring up a list of all the personnel at, minimize it, here at a and So I'm just gonna actually put myself as the PI. Okay, and then it'll ask if you have a conflict, if the PI has a, a financial conflict of interest related to the research, and then there's a spot for you to update that protocol template that we were discussing earlier. In order to move forward on this page, you do have to enter information. So I'm just gonna make some um, nonsense words so that we can move forward, because if I don't put, oh, it does not like that. Okay. So that I can move forward on the protocol and I can show you the next page. Uh, if it's a local, for local investigator, if it's a graduate student, is do, does the faculty member still need to be listed as a principal investigator? Can the student be listed as principal investigator? The faculty member needs to be listed as the principal investigator. Students cannot be um, principal investigators on a on an IRB protocol. Yes. Yeah. So it usually um, here's the thing. If there is collaborative research, which means that there are multiple institutions and every institution has their own IRB, there has to be a reason for us to develop a reliance agreement between those institutions. And then one of us will function as the IRB of record. That's really what that question is asking. And I know it's a little, it, it's weird because you say multi-site and sometimes you might be working at different schools, but we don't consider that a multi-site. We consider that a single site because A&M is the IRB of record. And then there's just data collection at those other locations. This is really in reference to, is there multiple institutions that have uh, their own IRB? And for some reason, one of those institutions will be function as the IRB of record for the research for all locations involved. Every um, A&M gets to make that decision whether we're willing to uh, enter into a reliance agreement with those other institutions and then allow one of those institutions either to review on our behalf or we are the IRB of record on them. So the reason I'm telling you you have to contact your IRB coordinators because you have to have a conversation where we determine if we're willing to either cede or take over the, the IRB review process. And if we are not, even though you might be multiple institutions working together, the IRB application would still say single site because A&M is only reviewing on, on its behalf. Before I get to this question, mm -hmm. I should have already done protocol template. What? I should have all that finished first. Yes. So don't even come start an application until you finish the template you're writing. Right. Yes, normally that's what I advise. Uh, the only time that I would say contact your IRB coordinator first is if you're in the situation where you might have a multi site study. Because you don't want to go through the process of completing a full template and then finding out that another institution may be the one that's reviewing the IRB and therefore you don't have to submit your own um, protocol template. So go ahead. And I'm sorry, I didn't repeat your question, Corey. Uh, before you get. That's a big change. Right? Yes. Iris, Iris should start in its site. But here you really should probably start with that protocol core doc, right? That's where you're writing down everything before you ever get to the system. Right. So. Uh, what Corey's bringing up is that before you access Huron, you should have all your documents ready. And that includes your protocol, that includes your study documents. And so really all Huron functions is, is collecting just very basic information from you and then attaching all your relevant documents. That's really all there is to it. Uh, and like I just mentioned, the only time that, that I would say that's an exception is if you have a multi-site study, if you think you have a multi-site study, contact your IRB coordinator so they can guide you as to what documents or what template you need to complete. I had another question here in the room. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm, if I'm interpreting the question right, is how, do, how does obtaining department share signature work here in, in here? I will get to that uh, a little later in our right. presentation. No, no, that's fine. That's a great question. I will get to that a little later in the presentation because it's a totally different process for how to get department chair sign up. The same way in IRS in here on, we can't tell you when your IRB chair is going to log in and sign off. We, we have no say when your, your, some department chairs literally take like a few minutes. They have completed it. Some take a month and we're, you know, so it totally depends on the department chair. Unfortunately, I can't uh, predict. Sure, I see maybe there are some questions online. As you have record, how would you use an external IRC? Um, that's a very, okay, IRB of record, how would you use an external IRB? That's a little bit of, of a general question. I don't know if I can answer it. It's just if another IRB has already reviewed the research and you are thinking that maybe you want that IRB to review on, on behalf of A&M, at that point, you need to contact your coordinator to see if that's the appropriate thing to do. Uh, Sometimes, because A&M ultimately gets the decision whether we're willing to see a review to an external IRB or not. So just because you're collaborating with somebody at UT Austin and they have gone ahead and gotten approval there, and then you're like, well, that's great because we're doing the same work, so we're going to allow them to review on behalf of A&M. That decision is ultimately ba ma based, made by A&M. We get to make a decision, and usually the only research that A&M is willing to seed review on is federally funded research in which there is a federal mandate for us to seed review to one IRB. There are other occasions, but they're on a base, um, base to base, you know, situation. But for the most part, a good rule of thumb is unless it, there's money involved, it's very unlikely that A&M is going to seed review to somebody else um, because it's just the way it is. That, but if you ever find yourself in this situation, call your IRB coordinator. They can walk you through the process. A decision can be made at that point, and then maybe there's a compelling reason for why another institution can be the IRB of record. For example, if you're working with a hospital, usually hospitals, something that A&M may be willing to see to review to. So again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Make sure you call your IRB coordinator if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're thinking someone else could be the IRB of record instead of A&M. Um, so I'm just going again through this application so we can move to the next page. Um, I don't have a financial conflict of interest, and now I'm going to attach the protocol that I, I have prepared. I'm going to select choose file, which will take me to my desktop. I am going to put my protocol, which I have been working on diligently, and it's ready to go. Um, I am going to minimize this a little more. Perfect. So you can either give it a different name if you don't like the, the name that you have saved the protocol under or you can give it a different version number. If you don't want to, if you think it's saved properly under protocol test, that's a good name for it. You select OK, it'll automatically generate a version number for you. So here it is, the document, it says protocol test version 0.01. And if you were to add another one, when you update it, it'll create a, a sequential number, so now it'll be 02. If you ever realize that you have attached the wrong, num uh, the wrong document, you can always press that little X and the document will be removed. I'm gonna select save. And what you'll see is that you now have additional pages to complete as part of the IRB application. I'm going to continue to the next page. The next page asks you for funding source information. So the nice thing is that eventually, it's not yet here in, in this, um, at this particular moment, but when Huron goes live, it will be there. Huron and Maestro will talk to each other, so you can actually look up your protocol based on the M number that SRS has provided you with. You can also look it up by the sponsor or the name of the PI. Uh, so you would just select the ellipses, and all of a sudden you'll see all these projects populate, and you can just select the one that's associated with that project. If your, fund, if your study doesn't have any funding, you would just select the study has no funding and move to the next page. Sometimes what happens is that you do have an award coming in. It just hasn't been set up in Maestro yet. We have an option for that. So you can select project not set up in Maestro, and then you would provide us information related to that uh, award. The only thing we do ask is that for any funded project that you provide us with any documentation related to that project. That usually comes in the form of, of a grant proposal, of a contract, if it's a subcontract or contracted work, or an award letter. So you would attach those documents here. Any question about that? 
Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next page. The next page is where you will be attaching, uh, telling us who your study team members are. I'm gonna select add, and then it'll give you a list of all A&M faculty and students. So I'm gonna add for here, Heather Klein, who works in our office, um, select okay. The next question will be, what's her role? So in IRIS, there was a, a much more significant list of, of potential roles that every individual could be. And here on, they're a little more condensed, but I'm pretty sure you'll all find a, something suitable for your team. I'm gonna make her a co-investigator. The next question is, will she be involved in the consent process? The answer is yes in this case. And then they'll ask if she has financial interest related to the research. And I'm gonna select no for that. And you're gonna to have to answer those questions for every team member you add. If you select okay, add another, you can just continue that way until you have added everyone. Yeah. If um, the So I'm gonna show you in a minute how to make somebody a PI proxy, uh, which I'm thinking a lot of PIs will make their graduate students who are the ones actually leading the project. I'll talk about that in a little bit. The only thing is that with that comes a principal investigator will give um, that graduate student or maybe that research staff the same privileges in, in here on that they themselves have, which means that they'll be able to submit the application. The only thing I caution with that is that you as a principal investigator are still ultimately responsible for the conduct of research. So you have to know, make sure that you have somebody and you know, that you trust to do, anyway, somebody you trust and that you know is responsible when you delegate that uh, responsibility. But I'll walk over how to do that. Um, at the same time, we'll talk about how to do department chair sign off. There is a different process for adding external personnel. So um, if you select add, what will happen is it'll take you to a location where you have to attach a file. That file is a spreadsheet and we provide that template to you in our link to where our, all our templates are. And unfortunately, every time I get try to get to it, it's just not, it's right here. There's a template up there where you find your protocol templates that is for external personnel. You would download that spreadsheet and in there you would enter all their information. What's your name? What's your contact information? When did they do their last city training? Um, I think what's their role in the research and what procedures they'll be conducting in the course of the research. That's anytime you're adding external personnel that are not part of a &M. So you would go through that, uh, complete that spreadsheet, and then you would attach it here, and that's how you now go through the process of adding external personnel to a, a single site study. There are instructions for how to do that in the um, PowerPoint presentation for submitting an initial application. I'm gonna select continue to move us to the next page, and the next page asks us, uh, whether the people or whether during the course of the research, if you're gonna be using a food or a dietary supplement or an approved drug. And the second question is whether you're gonna be using devices for collection of data. If you select yes to either or both of these, when you select save, you'll see that there's additional pages that are populated. And these pages specifically ask for information related to that drug or food item that you're using or the device that you're using in the course of the research. I normally pause here to ask people if they are actually using devices or drugs, but since the group is so big, I'm just gonna assume that yes, all of there's a likelihood that someone here in attendance is using drugs or devices. I'm gonna to navigate to the next page. Uh, the next page is ask you to tell us where your research is taking place. So you select add. This menu will never populate, so don't use it. You're gonna to have to do the same thing you used to do in Iris. Just give us the location name and the address, and you can put as many as you need by selecting okay and add another. So you're just writing in where you're going. Yes. So this is a very common question I've gotten in these trainings and it's where are you? Yeah, I'm, hold on, I'm going to get to you. Uh, and that question has to do with online research. So what do you enter here if you're doing online research? I always say, well, what did you do when you did it in IRIS? What did you enter? And usually investigators would put either research conducted online or give us the address of their office. 
I don't see your coordinator rejecting your application if you enter either option because we'll understand that you're doing it online. Okay. Okay, does this work better? Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, so that's how you would enter your information into the page. I'm gonna select save to move to the next page. The next page, just talk, we're gonna go through drugs. What it's gonna ask you to is to select add so you can give us the name of the drug you're using. This will not generate. So if you try to select ellipsis, it'll always be blank. The reason that is, is because when Huron gave us the list, it was all very much what hospitals utilize. And it's been our experience and none of our investigators ever be of no use and if anything, it would cause frustration. Most of the research we see here is either a supplement uh, or the use of food, in which case you would just enter the generic name of your food, drug, or even if you're using a drug, you would just enter the generic name uh, and the brand name if applicable. Then you tell us what type is it? Is it a drug? Is it a biologic food product? You would make that selection and then you would attach the label, whether it's the drug label or the supplement label, you would attach that information to us here and then select okay or okay, add another in case you are using multiple supplements or, or drugs. And then select cancel to get navigate out of that. And then it, of course, asks you if this drug that you're using is intended to treat, cure, mitigate a disease. Um, it's very rare that we get a situation where, in fact, that's why the drug is being utilized. But in case it is, then you would select yes to that. Um, if you are using a drug other than is intended uh, and you are thinking of maybe developing and bringing it up to market or something of that case where you have had to contact the FDA, if you have an IND it, um, on file, then we are asking that you attach it. We rarely ever see um, data come through through our office that actually requires an IND, but you can't ever say that we won't. So that's why we have that information available. The next page is drug uh, devices and the devices is basically the same thing. You're gonna select add, you're gonna tell us the name of your device. This menu will not populate because again, it was really just devices that are used in hospitals, which is not the kind of devices that A&M conducts, uses because we're not a hospital. So you would tell us where your device is. For example, if you're using an eye tracking device, that's something you would enter. A question that I've gotten a lot is, does a computer, if you're doing a survey, have to be included here? No, you don't have to include a computer. If you're audio recording your participants in the course of the research because you're doing interviews, you don't have to tell us that you're using an audio recording device. This is more like if you're asking them to wear a smartwatch in order for to track their physical activity, which is something we often see. If you are ever, using eye track technology, we want to see that. Um, let us know if you do, are doing MRI research, that kind of thing, which is TMS is another thing we often see. So those kind of devices you want to tell us, and then you want to attach the manuals. We go through the manuals and make sure that all the risks associated with the use of those devices are actually indicated in the consent document. That's why we always ask you to please provide us with the device manual. And this will like cancel. Um, this really has to do with an IDE. If you are ever using a device that you have developed and are intending to take to market or to treat or cure or mitigate a disease, then that's when FDA gets involved. Most of the research that gets done here at AM is with devices that are store-bought or that you have purchased offline. So they're broadly available. In those cases, usually the exemption or not applicable is what, what should be selected. If you ever are developing a device to go to market, contact us so that we can help you navigate that process and let you know that you do have to reach out to the FDA and what that is involved. But it's most likely that you all be in the exemption or not applicable category. If you do Mary, have, yes. I've got a quick question. Um, every project we have to continually upload all these device manuals. Mm -hmm. You have a central location. You only have to do it once and refer to it. It's really burdensome. You have to do it every time. Every time we use an EKG or you know a treadmill or whatever we're using with you know every study, we have lots of stuff we're measuring with, and we submit it over and over and over again. It'd be nice to have a centralized location for that. Um, neither Iris nor Huron are equipped to do that, and we ask that you submit them for every study because every study is a standalone uh, document. And so we can't, we can't assume that because you, for the last study, uh, that was what you used. This is what you're going to use for this study. So that's yeah, but what if we, we describe it in the, 
protocol, they were using the exact same DEXA machine. Sure. And have all that information, you know, it just seems like it's a lot of extra work to have to keep on uploading all these files. Every time we do a study, we might yeah. have, you know. I understand we don't have a process that's not centralized. And when um, our records get um, audited, the auditors don't go, oh, right, because there was a study before where they used. So every study has to be able to have be a standalone process. It has to be able to stand on its own. I, I understand the question. If you're asking, is there a mechanism for you to just have them and then attach them? And unfortunately, neither Iris nor Huron have them. I'm just explaining why that's being asked. Are the links live? So in other words, can we put it in a Google Doc and just paste the thing every time? You know, the reason we normally don't accept links is because links can be taken down. And so five years from now, if your file were to get audited and that link no longer exists, it, it can't stand alone. That's yeah, for the last 100 protocols, we submitted the same machines uh, every time. So okay. I, we're supposed to be getting a new system to make it easier. This would be a suggestion that it's a frustration to many faculty. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll take it into consideration. I'll bring it up to my director. but. For now, we do ask that you please upload your um, manual for every study, for every device that you're adding. The other question uh, we'll ask you about the safety or effect effectiveness of the device. Most of the research that gets carried out at a and does not actually do this, test the safety or effectiveness of the device. What you're actually just using it is to measure the physiological response of the participants. So one, uh, we see a lot of... Um, biological tracking of the participants. So it usually is no here, but like I said, there might be a study where you are actually developing a device and you wanna see if it actually improves the human condition, in which case you would select yes. But if you select yes for that, you know we're probably gonna to have to have a conversation about what if you've talked to the FDA and if you haven't, what are the next steps for that um, FDA conversation? Yes, please. So I, right. So I, again, that's the same question I've encountered a lot, which is what information do you put there um, in the location if you are doing in a public setting, if you're going to libraries, and I always just reference back, what did you use to put an iris when you got to that question? We're not gonna ask for anything additional to that. Whenever you're doing libraries, most people will say, we're just going to every library in town and, and that usually suffice. We don't usually ask you to give us the specific information. Um, specific information would probably be applicable if you're going into a hospital, then we wanna know what hospital you're going into. Um, if you are saying, I'm just going to go on campus at the A&M campus and go into any coffee shop, we're not going to have you go in there and tell us specifically every Starbucks on, on campus, right? And so basically the same information you would have normally provided in IRIS is what you're going to have to enter here. We're not going to overtax you and ask you to you know, name every single location. If you submit it and there's a reason your coordinator feels that maybe there's additional information that is required, they will communicate that with you. But for now, just proceed as you would have an iris by telling us, you know, just broad, if it's a broad public location. The dashboard when okay how do you get to the dashboard oh okay so how do you get to the irb workspace is the question so we don't have the url available to investigators yet that's why so that's why you can't get to it. it it's not, it's not that, that we're missing it. It's just not available yet. The, the vendor hasn't given it to us. That's why we can't share it.
But if you look at the first picture uh, on the PowerPoint presentations, you'll see that it, it says click on the IRB. So when you log in, it'll go directly to your dashboard. Then you'll click, that's a, we don't have it yet. So once you get that URL, you'll be able to log in it'll, directly. Once we have it, we're gonna email via the outreach like we, we have been doing, and then we'll also update the website. So yes, we just don't have it yet. The website is where we have our website, the HRPP website, where we have been notifying you about um, the conversion process. Okay. I don't know. Whenever it goes live, whenever Huron tells us they're ready to go, is when we'll we'll be ready to go. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, okay, I'll talk about where to upload the uh, site approval letters. Um, I don't know about this. We'd have to talk to our IT team. Keep in mind that um, anything that involves technology is usually we have to talk to our IT. We, that's not a decision that the IRB gets to make much. Like anytime you guys create something, uh, your IT department needs to make sure it's secure and it's compliant. So do we. And so we, I can't promise that we can generate a process um, if our IT hasn't signed off on it. So, But I will bring that up. I know that that that's something that now understand is something that you guys would like a resource available. So I can always talk to our director C of IT can help us uh, create something of that. The only thing is, if, well, no, that's a good idea. Let me talk to her uh, and see if maybe we can do that for you um, and make sure I, IT signs off on it. But that's a good idea. I can I can bring that up. I think. Okay. All right. So you can add your research locations. We've talked about drugs, we've covered devices, and now we get to the last page. This is the last page of the application and it, all you have to do here is add your um, study documents. So this, there's one to add your consent document. I'm gonna select add, choose file. It's gonna take me to my desktop. I have a consent document ready, select open. You can either rename it if you don't like the name or you can give it a ver different version number and select okay, and that's, so attach, there is a place for all recruitment material. You can select add, choose file. I'm gonna select my uh, recruitment email, select open. It's now attached, okay? So just like Corey mentioned here in a minute, you should have all your documents ready. If you have all your documents ready when you go to submit, this should probably take you about 30 minutes to complete. You select, you can select as many files. This is a simple study I have designed, it's just a survey. You select choose. I only have my survey instrument to it. There's different things it could be. It's a survey questionnaire in this case. You can add your um, site authorization letter here because I know somebody had asked about attaching your site authorization. You can attach it here. If you have a delegation log, you can attach your delegation log here and attach it. So basically any document you have at the end of attaching every file that you're like, I don't know where it goes, this is where you attach it. If there's not a label for it, you can always select other and, and just attach your document. I'm gonna select cancel on this. And every document available. of Word document. I want to bring note, is it because your protocol is actually going to be a Word document? Your IRB coordinator is going to download that document to their desktop and then you use track changes to suggest changes and write comments on the margins to say, hey, I need this information right here. And so one of the nice things is that that's how we're going to communicate. I know that's how you're all used to communicating with each other with Word documents and to ask changes or or modifications, that's how we're gonna start doing it as well. You never have to agree to a track change. If you don't think it's appropriate, you can always decline it. You'll have that same, but we will, uh, when possible, suggest changes that might help you move the, the document along. I see a question. Yes, so the question is, does Huron generate auto email alerts when 
understanding is that yes, you get one in 90, 60, and 30. So, and you can. But on the dashboard, the, there's a box that says your these studies are set to expire. So they'll so they'll be you very that are about to expire. Okay, so this is the last page of your application. You se select save, and then it takes you to this. This says final page, but the other one is the last one that you have to add information to. It tells you to select finish, and it'll take you right to the study workspace. Keep in mind that just because you select finish does not mean that the application has been routed to the IRB office. It just means that it, that application has been brought back and saved onto your study workspace. So I'm going to select finish. And what you'll see is that your study is still in pre-submission. So if you want to keep working on it, if you thought maybe you missed something, you can always select edit study. It'll bring you right back to your IRB application. You can jump around to the whatever section needs to be modified. So for example, let's say you forgot to attach a document. You can always come back to that page, attach your document, select save, and then exit. You select exit and it'll take you back to the workspace. I'm going to walk through what are these. Uh, so you have history and the history is where everything related to when it was created, any comments that the IRB has shared with you, any information, any modifications, continue review will be here in the that you have in. get stamped and you have approval for your study, you'll be able to come here. And if you select them, you'll be able to download them to your desktop. Yesterday, somebody asked what this history is, and it's actually a very neat um, option. So if you select history, it'll take you to this page where you'll be able to see previous versions that have been approved, and you can actually compare them. So if you have multiple versions of, of that uh, document you've attached, you'll be able to compare between those documents. This option is only available for uh, documents that are uploaded as a Word document. That's why, in answer to your question, we love Word documents. I think you can it gets uploaded as a Word document. I understand that there's some things that can't be but when possible, use Word, especially your protocol it needs to be Word or it'll be returned to you. No, that's a great question. And everyone asks why I keep doing it. I keep doing it because I, I have navigated to continue. It always has automatically saved it. But let's say you've been working on it and it didn't save it. I don't want you to get mad at me and say that I didn't teach you to save. Okay. I have seen at other institutions that use the tool, they're very clear, like always hit that save button. So it's good practice to use it. If you forget and you navigate, you're probably, it's probably going to be auto saved, but just. It's good practice, okay? Because I know in Iris, that was always an issue. Sometimes people would have been working on their application all day and then saved it, they thought, and it was not saved. So just go. when your application is submitted to the IRB, there'll be uh, information related to its approval. So once your application is approved, you can select the review button and it'll give you information related to the approval. Snapshots. Uh, occasionally, or periodically uh, here on, once your application is approved, we'll take a picture of your protocol. And that's just for good record keeping. So it just systematically it'll take the protocol and you can always reference them and make sure that what it looked like at that time, moment in time. And then there's a training tab, which only went live where you can find your uh, city information for your participants. It's currently not loaded yet, but it will be when Huron goes live. And so you'll be able to tell if the people you've added have completed their city training or not. Okay, here, Corey put together the IRB application because Corey's not the PI, he can't submit the protocol. So he does not have the option to submit the protocol. At this point, what Corey can do is select add comment and write me a Hey, Denise, and submit the protocol since I'm the PI. Ask me the other day if there's any using this as opposed to, I'd rather send an email uh, because way of ignoring things from the IRIS system, like 
and emails you get from Iris and message. It might be better to just send a login and sign off. One thing that might be useful is to email your, to send your IRB coordinator a message in Huron. And if I can remove this. It's just. There's no X. Does that go away? But this is the one that's in the way. Hi, video. Thank you. You're wonderful. You're, you're my favorite person today. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> you're the, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna switch users so I can be the PI uh, because I've made myself the PI. So I have to go to my desktop. I'm gonna go with, without impersonation, this is mine. This is what guys, um, dashboard is likely to look like. There'll be a bunch of studies notifying you that your study is about to expire. They probably would have gone through a bunch of uh, submissions in one point. So this is the ones they've recently looked and studies that have been pinned. That's why the pin becomes important, especially for a very busy. This is my inbox. There's a lot of studies that are requiring some sort of, of action. So this is what you can expect if you have a very large portfolio studies. I'm going to open this. There's a submit option. So as a PI, I can submit that study. PI study personnel. You can only assign a PI proxy for someone who's already part of your study personnel. Privileges as I do in here in Huron, which that she's taken over at the department chair by indicating manage ancillary reviews you select add and i am going to put mindy bergman because she is required yes because you do occasions i'm going to select goodness move out of the okay Okay, and so now she'll get notification that she needs to log into Huron and sign off on that protocol. Only other thing, let me see, is there anything else that we need to do before we submit the study? I don't think so. I think it, this study is ready to be submitted to the IRB. The only thing I wanna point out is that as we've been doing things on the study, you see the history has been expanding to let you know what, what has been occurring in the study. Let's say as the PI, I, before I submit it, I wanna look at the study so I, I know everything's okay. I would select edit study. And then now I'm able to look, go through the protocol and make sure that I agree with everything that was added, that nothing was incorrectly touched. And before I select um, submit. So exit, we're gonna select submit. And now that study has been, oh, if you ever encounter this, what is happening is that some of the questions that had the red asterisk were not answered. So I'm going to select close, edit study. Um, you can go to this validate button and it'll show you what's wrong. So what happened is that we had selected the drugs and we didn't fill in the information related to it. So it won't let us proceed. So that we can proceed here, I'm just going to select no, which will basically make those questions, those pages go away. So we don't have to complete them. Everything's good now. I'm going to select and exit. And now we're able to submit the protocol because those, those pages don't exist anymore, basically. So we're gonna submit the protocol, okay. And now what you'll see is that the study will go from the pre-submission phase to the pre-review. The pre-review means that it has been some, uh, the IRB coordinator is gonna be assigned to that protocol. They're gonna work with you in order to get that study ready for IRB review. As long as that means that it's on our hands. So pre-review means the IRB coordinator has it. IRB review means that the IRB reviewer has it. And post-review means that the IRB coordinator, that the reviewer has most likely finished their review and has sent it to the IRB coordinator to finish. 
coordinator. What that means is either the IRB coordinator or the reviewer is asking you for changes and you have to log into Huron and address those changes, okay? There is a, like I mentioned, there's a PowerPoint presentation to, teach, to show how to address those changes. Um, in IRIS, it was very difficult to withdraw a study here. All you have to do is select that withdraw. For example, let's say you submitted, but you remembered you had to send a notification to the review comment that says, hey, select OK, and that protocol comes back to your desktop to continue working on it. So it goes back to that pre-submission state, and you can edit your study. You can always discard a study, so sometimes, or a submission. Sometimes you decide you're not going to proceed with a modification. Or maybe you filled out the wrong form. You can always select discard right here, and that'll discard the submission. Okay. So around and talk about legacies. Sure. Um, so when Huron goes live, I'm assuming it won't be, okay, let's live. I doubt that the, there'll be a board meeting immediately that first start of the Monday. So maybe the second, I don't, we haven't been given, because usually when we assign, so if it goes, there's no submissions that first the month may be skipped. It might be the second. But the protocol may be not be ready to go to full board. That so if you submit like 24th and the first meeting is maybe on the what is what is the first the third August 3rd by August 3rd your protocol may not have been properly processed and be ready to full board. And so we try to only convene the board when the protocols are ready to be reviewed. And so that's why I'm saying, I can't tell you specifically because to a month actually. So it's the first and third uh, Wednesday of the month. So, so you're used to first, maybe it won't be that very depending on the live date and how many um, submissions we have. Does that answer your question? I know I can't, it's not, <laughs> it's not specific. It's just, uh, we, we really do because as you all know, uh, our, our reviewers are doing this. Um, they volunteer their time. So we try to be very mindful of their time when we convene, convene them. So any other questions that appeared? Corey, can you? Okay, okay. I'll give is if okay. Well, okay. I think the battery's going. That's what I thought. I think the battery's going down on the mic. So, um, we are going to transition to. Let's just talk very briefly about like legacy, legacy studies. Okay, we're going to take a quick break because we've been going for about an hour 15. Uh, and then Denise is going to hang out. We'll change the batteries in the microphone. And then um, she can talk a little bit about the transition, I guess, from Iris over to Huron. And because we do have some interest in people's things. So hold on for just a minute, okay? Five-minute break. Five-minute break.
All right. I see a lot of you stay behind. Thank you. Am I muted? No, I'm good. Thank you, Corey. Uh, well, I'm glad you're all sticking around and it shouldn't take very much more of your time. It's just, I wanna make prepare you for what you can expect and give you an opportunity to ask me questions about your legacy studies. So Dr. Yentes has been nice enough to let me um, impersonate her here. And this is what her dashboard will look like when she logs in. There'll be nothing in her inbox because there's nothing waiting for her to, to go through. Uh, there's also going to be a study that is due for uh, maybe it's about to expire here in a little bit. So you'll be able to submit uh, either a continuing review or yeah, it's a full board study. So you'll probably have to submit a continuing review for this study. Okay. Um, then she hasn't gone through any studies recently. So this is what her dashboard will look like. When you navigate to the IRB dashboard, um, what you'll want to go to is active, and that's all your studies that are active. And so those are the studies that came over from IRIS. And in this case, there are three studies that came over. And I'm just going to open one of them, and we'll go through it so you can kind of see what your submission will look like. Open the study. Uh, you can view your study, and you can see what information came over. So from IRIS, you can see that the uh, title of the study came over, the short title, a brief description of the study came over, and then what kind of study is this? Uh, it indicated single site study. We're hoping that this will be correct, but if it's not, you'll be given the opportunity when you open your study to submit to correct. Keep in mind that during that first modification, you'll have the opportunity to correct any information that did not come over correctly. Um, and Dr. Yentes, please speak up if any of this doesn't look correct to you, because this is all being fed automatically from, from IRIS. Um, it indicates that we're the IRB of records, so that has indicated no. It list Dr. Yentes as the uh, PI. This is wrong. So this we're hoping will be corrected by the time Huron goes live. It indicates that, um, that you have a financial conflict of interest, which I'm guessing you don't, because very few investigators actually do, but that... Ah, okay. All right, great. That's good to know. You are going to have to attach a copy of your protocol. And we'll be talking about that here shortly as to what flexibility we'll have going forward with um, studies that came over from IRIS. The funding source, my understanding is that once Huron goes live, it'll actually feed that funding source. But if it hasn't, and you know that project is associated with a sponsor, you can always update that information during your modification. The individuals that you listed in IRIS will come over. The only catch is if you had external personnel added to your studies there, they're not going to feed over. So you're going to have to go through that step of making the spreadsheet and attaching it. The study scope is all, always going to default to no, no. That's just the way it is because most studies around here don't actually require uh, devices or drugs. So it just defaults to no. If you have a study that does include a drug or a device, you're gonna select yes and then fill out those uh, pages. The location of your research is not coming over. So you're gonna have to tell us that. And then all your study documents are also not coming over. The reason we didn't do that is because of document management and IRIS is, is kind of always been terrible. And it's one of the reasons we were, among other reasons, we're not great fans. And so one of the things I wanted, uh, I think I already mentioned, but I wanna bring it up again, is that you only have to give us the documents that you are currently utilizing. You don't have to give us the history of every document you've gone through. It's just the one you're currently planning to use, the survey you're currently planning to use, or whatever whatever tools you're giving out to your surveys, observation protocols, anything you're using currently, that's what you're gonna attach here, okay? Um, Iris is not going away. So you can always log into IRIS and download those documents. That's something all investigators have been asking uh, because sometimes they don't have the latest copy on their desktop. So they want to reference IRIS. You, you'll be able to go into IRIS and download those documents. Uh, for your legacy studies, you will, however, not be able to submit any more modifications or personnel change requests in IRIS. Everything moving forward, you'll have to submit in, in here on related to these legacy studies. Okay. So that's pretty much what you can expect your study to look like, what information came over from IRIS. I'm gonna go back. When you are ready to submit that first modification, you'll select that create a modification button. And the only reason I'm not gonna do this for you and demonstrate it is because I don't know if I do this, it'll mess up the what came over. So I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna mess up your, your protocol, but we do have step-by-step -step instructions on, on that PowerPoint that 
tells you what the next page is going to be, what you can expect. The page basically will ask you if you uh, what modification you're change doing. During that first modification, you're going to submit to finish populating your application. You can also make schedule changes. So let's say you submitting the modification in order to finish populating your IRB application, but you also have been waiting to submit a, a an amendment or mod they're called modifications in Huron, but um, you've been waiting to submit a modification to add a new survey instrument. You can do that in the same modification. You don't have to do two separate ones, okay? Much like you used to have to do an IRIS, you're going to have to update your protocol whenever you make that change. So let's go back to that protocol situation. We, and I'm hoping it's here because if not, nope, it's not. They're working right now to turn a lot of those documents into PDF. What's going to happen is that here in your documents file, there should be a copy of your initial approval letter. So this is the, the approval letter for this study you'll have access to that. And by the time it goes live, there will also be a PDF version of your application in IRIS. We are do, being flexible as to how you can uh, modify that document. You have two options. You can turn that PDF into a Word document and then work off of that. So it, it'll, turn, it'll turn into a Word document and you can just track changes for any changes you wanna make to that protocol and then attach it to your application. Or, you can copy paste the information that was in that IRB application into one of our templates. Uh, I recommend that if your study is going to be open for another four or five years, or it's just a study you plan to submit a lot of modifications to, that you just go ahead and copy paste that information into your protocol, into a Word protocol, one of the templates that we have provided for you. I think it'll just be easier for you moving forward to make modifications. But again, that is up to your discretion. And I think that's one of those things you'll make a choice about once you encounter it and see what works better for you. Okay. Um, and I think, yes. Uh, the question is, will expired IRB studies also be into uh, here on? Yes. Uh, expired studies are being moved over as long as it's just Again, studies are not coming over. So closed studies are not coming over. Your 118 determinations are not coming over. Your not subject research determinations are not coming over. But if you have M determination, you're going to have to do it in here. It won't continue. Final approval. You do not get final approval on your protocol before. I don't know. Did you? Did you I don't. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so some of the data. So the question is, uh, Dr. Yentes did submit a continuing review prior to the cutoff date, and it's not showing appropriately in, in Huron. So they're periodically pushing data so that we can test what it looks like. So this may be old data. So by the when it goes live, it'll have the most up to So these, these here are not the final things. It's not absolutely final. What's happening is that they're giving us access so we can kind of play around and make sure of, the, of what happened in IRIS is being moved over to here on. Only caveat on this. 
I see maybe another credit. No, it's about the audio. Off every now and then, because I don't know. I'm sorry, it's the microphone. I don't know what to do about that. Okay. Any other questions related to legacy studies? I, I'd be happy to um, discuss anything further, or if you're online, you can just start shooting questions. But if not, I think we're ready to go. Thank you. We have some, uh, we still have some uh, bagels back there. You can take them back to the, uh, the HRPP office. We had a lot of questions. Thanks. I go live pretty quick. Maybe we have uh, host another one, um, maybe toward the end of August or at, once people are, get a chance to get their feet wet. If they want to uh, have a forum for questions or something like that, we might we might do that as well. If there's interest um, amongst the researchers in, in SCHD. And everyone has. Day. And uh, we will. We did record this, so we will be processing that and posting it to the website in the next um, few days to uh, allow for people to be able to access that if they need to. So, thank you. And have a good day.